Right, sorry about the delay. Um, there are quite a few more people here than we, than we expected, but it's a, it's a good thing to see. So this lecture is in the nature of an experiment. So it, it um, begins the second annual National Cancer Research Institute conference, and it's a lecture particularly for a lay audience, so a lecture for the public. And I think it's very important that the scientific communi community engages with the public in a, in a really profound way. And this is for a, a whole host of reasons. One reason is in, in the UK in particular, much of the money for cancer research comes from the general public through charitable giving. And it's utterly critical that we explain where this money's gone so that people know that their money's been spent well. In a, in a sense, they're the shareholders of the, of the company. And like any good company, we should explain what, what we do with the money that's, that's uh, been donated. The second thing is, in, in the scientific community, science has had a variable reputation over the last few years in, in disclosure. So there are a lot of high-profile incidents, some of which are, can be blamed on scientists, some of which can be blamed on politicians, where the, the public has lost respect and regard for science as an institution. So I think if we can convey the message and the excitement of what we're doing, it will, it will take the public with us uh, on this uh, uh, goal of, of doing something about cancer. So I can't think of a better person to deliver this, uh, this first lecture than Fran Bolquill. Fran is first and foremost a scientist. She's actually so good at science communication that occasionally people forget that she's a fantastic scientist. And she does really brilliant work on the interaction of cancer cells with the, with the host. And that's a, that's a growing um, area in cancer research in which you will talk about, I'm sure. And Fran has um, written many books, particularly uh, for children, about um, science, and a really brilliant book about um, HIV infection for children, which I believe the, the Gates Foundation funded the, um, the distribution of um, to, to Africa, and I think that was a really a brilliant thing to do. She's um, founded a, a center in East London called uh, Center of the Cell, really to, to engage the public in, in scientific research. And this year she was the recipient, recipient of the Faraday Prize of the Royal Society for Scientific Communication. And today she's going to talk to us about this, the subjects of how we can beat cancer and what she's called Mission Possible. Thank you very much, Alan. And uh, thank you all for coming. Um, it's it's a great sort of honor to be invited to this first experimental public lecture, but it's also a bit scary as well, especially with those bright lights there. Um, I'm first and foremost a scientist. It what pays, it's what pays the mortgage. It's what fascinates me. Um, and my day job um, is working in a lab where we study a particular cancer called cancer of the ovary. And we're not just interested in the whys and wherefores of that cancer, but we're also interested in how we can use the knowledge that we and other people gain about that cancer and other cancers to find new ways of treating and detecting cancer of the ovary. And it's a particularly challenging cancer. I spent really all my working life um, working in cancer research, and I have to say that this is the most exciting time for me. Some people say it's a golden age, and I don't think it's far off that. This is really an exciting time because we understand almost every day more and more about cancer, but we're also using that understanding to find different and new and better treatments for cancer. So what I'm going to do today is tell you a little bit about that excitement and all the new information we have, but also put it in the context of the one cancer that I think I know most about and I'm most interested in, in and, and that's a very challenging cancer to treat. So we'll start off by talking a little bit about cancer of the ovary, then talk about cancer research in general, and finish up going back to talking about cancer of the ovary. We'll see if this works. Okay, so ovarian cancer, I can't see that myself, ovarian cancer has been called by some the silent killer. And this is because in many women, when they finally diagnose with ovarian cancer, they've had the cancer for a long time, or the cancer has spread quite widely, 
which makes it more difficult, but, but not impossible, makes it more difficult to treat. So it's silent for quite a long period of time. And I'm reminded about ovarian cancer practically every day of my working life, because I'm lucky enough to live in and work in central London. And every day, I walk through a beautiful place called Bunhill Fields. I don't know whether any of you know where or what it is, but it's a, it's a burial ground um, in central London. There's very historic people there like Blake and Bunyan and, and Daniel Defoe and some great thinkers. I, I always hope that I sort of get a little bit of their spirit, but I'm not sure about that. But anyway, every morning I walk through Bunhill Fields and I see amongst the many grand monuments, there's this one here. And if you look closely at it, you see that it's in memory of a lady called Dame Mary Page, um, who died in the 56th year of her age in 1728. Nothing particularly special about that. But if you go around the back of it and have a look, it says, and it's quite difficult to read on this particular, in 67 months, she was tapped 68 times, had taken away 240 gallons of water without ever repining at her case or ever fearing the operation. Now, my medical friends tell me that it's almost certain that that lady had cancer of the ovary. And one of the symptoms of cancer of the ovary is a lot of fluid accumulating that needs to be tapped from the abdominal region. And so that always reminds me every day. And I think, well, that's what happened to somebody in 1728. 200 years later, in 1928, nothing much would have changed. Even 50 years later, in 1978, Dame Mary Page's fate wouldn't have been much different. But I think what I can say, and I feel really confident in saying, is before 300 years is up, that the fate of somebody presenting with advanced ovarian cancer will be quite different. And I want to talk to you for, about one, some of the reasons for that. But if you, to give you an idea, this is... There's only two graphs I'm going to show you, so don't worry too much. Um, these, this is the survival over five and ten years of women diagnosed with, with, with ovarian cancer. And you can see that it hasn't changed much. That graph has not shifted very much in the last ten or so years. And you compare it to the survival of women with breast cancer. And you can see that ovarian cancer is much more of a challenge. But let's go back and think about cancer in general. The good news is, and the most important news is, that we know what cancer is. And if you understand something, it makes it a lot easier to treat it. Now, it may seem crazy to a lot of you, whether you're um, non-scientists or scientists. Well, of course we know what cancer is. But 50 years ago, I don't think we were sure, even maybe 20 years ago. So. On the basis of having that information, I think we can now say, will cancer, ovarian cancer always be silent? Will it be, always be a killer? And the answer is, I think, no. So what do we know about cancer? We know what causes cancer now. Cancer is caused by damage to DNA. It's a very simple but very important fact. Cancer is caused by damage to that information store, the DNA that was in the first cell that was you, the DNA that's in the 100 million million cells that make up each of you, that's copied every time one of your cells become two cells. That is what causes cancer. And the damage we now know is in three different types of genes. The bits of DNA that do the work of DNA, that code for the proteins that make your cells. And in general, we can say that cancer happens because there are damage in particular groups of genes that we call oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes, and the genes that control DNA copying. You don't need to worry about that. But we know what causes cancer now. But why do we get damage to DNA? Well, we're going to watch a little movie. This is very, very beautiful.